The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas, February 16, 17, and 18 in 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference. Go to BitcoinSuperConference.com and register today as a super early bird to get the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's BitcoinSuperConference.com. Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Podcast. Um, my guest today is Richard Lin, the CEO of Thrive Inside. Uh, it's spelled T-H-R-Y-V-E-I-N-S-I-D-E, thriveinside.com. Richard, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Uh look forward yeah. to talking to your audience and, um, yeah, excited to be here. Great. All right. Well, tell the listeners, you know, first question, the basic one's always the best. Uh, tell me about Thrive Inside. What do you guys do? Sure. So Thrive helps people learn about the microbes inside their body to improve their health. And so, actually, I started this company because two years ago I took uh, antibiotics, ended up getting really sick and hospitalized for it. And uh, I started researching this thing called the, yeah, I know, it's kind of scary, um, researched this thing called the microbiome, which is the bacteria, yeast, and viruses that reside inside and outside our bodies. And uh, I quickly realized from the scientific literature that the microbes that we house um, are related to a whole host of different diseases. So from neurological diseases like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis to digestive issues like IBS and inflammatory bowel disease to skin problems like eczema and acne and even to metabolic issues like our weight loss and weight gain. And I quickly realized a lot of different people were looking into the microbiome to really understand what microbes they had in their body, what they can do about it, and ultimately how to improve their health. And there really wasn't a really good solution out there. And so uh, we created the first uh, kind of gut health program that incorporates both uh, a personalized probiotic, so a, a personalized supplement um, based on uh, a test result that we also send out, which is based on your microbiome. So we sequence the different microbes in your body, and we can tell you uh, specifically which one of these microbes are good for you, they're neutral in your body, or they're actually bad for you, and then how they actually affect um, your health. Uh, what are their side effects and what foods you can take uh, to kind of improve that state? Yeah, that's great. Um, a couple of years ago, I got a, I, I used Ubiome and I sent in a sample and um, they sent me back a, you know, a profile of microbes, but at the time they didn't tell me anything. They just said, oh, you have, you know, bifidus and whatever is and acidophilus, you know, this or this. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, that's great. But what, what do I do? What, what do you do mean? about it? Right. Yeah. So, so you're saying now, um, if I order a sample kit from you, you know, I'll send it back and you'll not only tell me what's in there, but what it does and how it affects me. Exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, Ubiome, um, more respect to them. They they were the first, I think, microbiome company to start. And I, I'm a power user of Ubiome myself. But like, like you said, one of the biggest problems is they tell you there's microbes in your body, but it's all written in like Latin and I'm not quite sure what it means. And so right. we use software to uh, summarize all the very technical scientific literature into uh, easy to understand uh, layperson kind of language. And so, uh, yeah, the difference between us and Ubiome is the fact that we can actually tell you which specific microbes are important to you, what are their side effects, health benefits, and all the scientific research to back up those claims, and then uh, which specific foods that you should eat completely personalized for your microbiome. That's great. Um, you know, I know from the 80-20 uh, the rule, you know, a few elements represent most of the results. You know, what do you see when you look at people's microbiome profile, how many different species of microbes are in there? And is it where a few different species kind of predominate or they're just, you know, is it a whole collection of thousands of different ones? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it depends on how you classify the bacteria. So from a, you know, this is kind of taking you guys to biology 101, but um, when you think about different microbes, there's different hierarchies of uh, taxonomy ranks, which is uh, you think about like the animal kingdom, you have phylum and it goes down to family order, 
genus and in species. You can kind of think about phylum as like planet Earth, and you can think about species as like humans or dogs and so on and so forth. And so when you think about the phylum, very high level, most people have similar microbes from the phylum level from the very high level. So whether these are Firmicutes or Bacteroides or Proteobacteria. Um, but then when you start scaling down and looking much deeper in all the different species of microbes, then the variation becomes everyone is completely unique in that sense. And so, you know, right now the kind of average um, and the math of where the science is for microbiome is, you know, there's probably about 10,000 different species of microbes um, across the board that vary between different individuals. And there's probably a lot more that we just haven't discovered yet. But right now, the ones that we commonly know are about 10,000 different species. And so uh, from a species level, there's a huge variance. Every, it's, it's like a fingerprint. Everyone is different in that sense. So you could have thousands of species, but how many have you found to be, how many actually does science understand? I would bet that out of all the different species that are in there, there's no way we can know what all of them do. So, like, what yeah. percentage of all the species you see do, do science uh, understand? I bet you there's a few that they know really well, and then a lot of them that they know somewhat, and then some that they don't know anything, right? Exactly. No, that's a that's a great question. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, most uh, most of the microbes we have general knowledge of. Uh, we not all the microbes we have very in depth knowledge of, and so um, it, it just varies and depends. Like, for instance, some probiotics like Bifidobacterium lactobacillus have a lot of research behind them and we have a lot of understanding of their interactions, the chemicals they produce and enzymes and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's some microbes that are just newly discovered, maybe just happened you know, last month that we even knew there was a microbe like this that existed. And so we have very limited information on that. I'd say about four to 5,000 different species of microbes at this point have a decent amount of um, kind of uh, research behind it. And so that's, that, that's the current ones we have mapped out, uh, about four to 5,000 of them. That's a lot though, that's still a lot. Yeah, how much variation do you see amongst people? Like, are all your customers in the U.S.? And can you, I don't even know if you're able to get this data, but, you know, do Asian, people of Asian descent have different um, microbiome versus um, European? And, like, what, what variations do you see and how varied is it? That's a great question. Yeah, so location is a huge factor in microbiome profiles. And so what we've seen with people in Western populations versus people in developing countries, the variation is quite drastic. Uh, we've seen in terms of the diversity of the microbiome and just to kind of give you a bit of context on diversity. So a healthy gut normally has a very diverse ecosystem of microbes, just like a rainforest has all the different kinds of species to kind of maintain its habitat. The gut is the same way. You know, the less diverse your gut is, the less your gut is able to handle uh, pathogenic bacteria, you know, foreign objects, digest foods, synthesize vitamins, and so on. And so uh, we've seen with different locations, you know, people that have grown up in more Western populations that have kind of a standard American diet, not a lot of fiber, have, tend to have a very smaller amount of diversity in their microbiome. And also the good bacteria that are known to be in more uh, kind of a healthy, fibrous diet are non-existent in Western populations. And so, uh, you know, we have customers from Japan to, you know, uh, the UK, US, and other different kind of countries, Africa, and things like that. And so we definitely see a huge variance. And one of the things we uh, feature in our report is a wellness score. And that wellness score tells you out of zero out of 100 how healthy your gut is. And we categorize that based on location. So uh, we benchmark your score against other people in the same location versus you versus somebody else in, like, say, Africa, because uh, the diet and the environment is just so different that uh, we've seen a lot of a lot of variance. And there's a theory called the you know the the hygiene theory where the reason why our microbiome is so non-diverse and there's you know just a lack of good bacteria and more bad bacteria is because of how hygienic we are all the antibiotics we take, all the processed foods we eat, all the sanitizers and so on and so forth that we use um, cause the microbiome to be kind of not the same state as we originally were. Thankfully, there's a lot of opportunity for eating the right foods and kind of restoring that balance. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So, you know, if I have a, a, an undiverse microbiome, what are the biggest modulators to fix me? Is it taking probiotics? Is it eating differently? Is it a combination of those two? Anything else I can do to fix myself? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a combination. And when we started um, kind of Thrive, we, we really thought about 
that um, kind of the problem of an imbalanced microbiome, how to fix it. And it really does come down to introducing the good bacteria that's potentially not in your body. So through probiotics, you supplement with that, or you have kefir or kimchi or other fermented foods to improve that area. And on the other side of it is eating whole foods called prebiotics. So not probiotics, which are, you know, the good bacteria. Prebiotics are fibers that feed those good bacteria. And a lot of bacteria in the gut, um, you know, we can't actually create as a supplement yet. And so the only way to make them grow is to have them existing in your body already and then feeding them the right foods. And so it's really a conjunction of both supplementing with probiotics as well as uh, supplementing with the right whole food sources to improve the overall balance of your gut. Got help. Yeah, so that's so probiotics means you're putting these bacteria in your body. Prebiotics is they need to eat something. I got a, I got a funny question. I don't mean this. Be, it's not meant to be an ambush or anything, but I just happen to be in Whole Foods right now, actually, and I'm I'm in front of the probiotic section. I figure why not walk around while I talk to you? And I I see like uh, Ultimate Flora. They have 15 billion, 25 billion, 30 billion, 80, 100, 200 billion. Some have seven strains. Some have 50 strains. What do I? How do I know what I should have? You know, is this just all made up stuff? Is it the more bacteria, the better? I mean, like if I'm a customer here, standing here in front of this stuff, how do I know what will help me? Or should I only go with a custom mix? What are, what are your recommendations there? Yeah, I love where you're going with that question. Um, that's actually one of the biggest problems with probiotics is the um, kind of confusion around what actually works, what does it actually do? And so, um, you know, when you're at Whole Foods, over the counter looking at all these different labels. What we realize is when we're doing our research on just the probiotic market and the brands and the products available, um, we realize that about 94% of the probiotics that are offered off the shelf don't actually contain what's advertised in terms of their CFU counts. For context, for your, uh, your viewers, CFU stands for colony forming units. So it's a total amount of bacteria within a, a serving, if you will. And so when you say 100 billion CFU, that means 100 billion bacterial cells or probiotic cells within that one capsule. And so we realize about 94% of them don't actually contain the number of CFUs as well as the strains they say are actually in the probiotic. The reason why is because we... Wait, wait, wait. So they, they don't even have the strains they say? I mean, how, some, how some, different a is good it from what's advertised? It's quite variants, and I can we can send you some of that uh, research that we've seen in, in nature as well as our own. Uh, and so some wow. of the, a good portion of the strains aren't even actually yet contained in there. And so that's very concerning for us, uh, especially when people are buying $80, $90 probiotics, you know, the, you know, off the shelf. The other side of it is um, the supply chain effort of probiotics. Because they're living bacteria, you need to keep them refrigerated, uh, not only when they're in the store, but when you're shipping them cross-country to the store, when you're manufacturing them, they just they need to be in the right quality control. And we realized a lot of these probiotic companies were not thinking about the whole process. They would refrigerate it when it gets to the Whole Foods, but then while it's getting transported there, it would actually be in a hot truck, right? So all the bacteria dies before it even gets to the, you know, the Whole Foods. And the third portion it's is crazy. It's, it's ridiculous. And so one thing we do differently is we actually double test it, both in manufacturing with all our different research partners in the probiotic industry. We also test it when we bottle it, uh, and, and we ship it out both uh, when we fly it over here uh, refrigerated, and we ship it out in ice as well in an insulated denim box. And then the third portion is about two-thirds of the probiotics actually all come from one to two different suppliers. So one of those suppliers is DuPont, which is a food company that you probably have never heard of, but they provide a lot of different food sources, and they also provide probiotic strains. A lot of the probiotics, about two-thirds of them, actually all come from the same supplier. So they're just the same strains, but they're just rebranded differently. And so we saw how kind of fragmented and kind of messed up the probiotic industry was. And so our, our solution here is really to think about, okay, how can we ship these probiotics completely on ice throughout the whole supply chain process, make sure that what we're telling you we're selling is actually in there, and also providing a personalized and customized solution. So we worked with multiple different probiotic manufacturers from Asia to Europe to the U.S. We create our own probiotic library, a strain library, and we use that to personalize each specific strain to each person. And uh, that personalization really completely blows everything out the water uh, in terms of over-the-counter. And on top of that, we also provide you a pamphlet as well as a web report online where you can actually look at each strain that we prescribe for you, and you can look at all the health benefits, all the research that is tied to that specific strain. And so you know exactly, okay, you know, this lactobacill strain, how does it actually help me? And you have a complete report and complete transparency throughout that process. Whereas if you buy it off the shelf, you don't really know what those strains, where the strains came from, are they even there, and if they are there, what can they actually do to help you? 
And so we've really provided yeah. all that um, transparency to the process. Well, how do I even know what's helped? You know, um, do you have people say to you, hey, I just can't lose weight or I'm tired all the time? Like, what, what are the things people say they want help with? And what's your goal when you actually choose the mix? What are you trying to uh, accomplish in them? Yeah, so um, our personalization comes through a questionnaire. And so based on your health goals, based on, um, you know, symptoms and things like that, whether it's digestive, immune, you know, autoimmune, immune health issues, uh, whether it's weight loss, general health, depression and mood symptoms, uh, we, we think about all those different indications and then we tailor a formula based on those indications. We also look at our microbiome tests. So if there's a huge variance uh, in terms of, hey, your microbiome test shows that your microbiome is pretty unhealthy, you have a lot of bad bacteria overgrowing, you know, what are the specific strains that can help with that condition as well? And what have you seen happen to your customers? Like, um, you know, without giving away, you know, John Smith did this or that. Yeah. Can you tell me some so, of the problems they've told you about and, and what your formula did to them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one cohort is digestion. And so we've seen customers with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, um, you know, go through our program in terms of the personalized nutrition and the personalized probiotic. And they've seen a complete change in their stool as well as their schedule. So they're they're not going as often. As you know, with some of these conditions, you could be at going to the bathroom 10 to 15 times a day. They've actually seen that uh, amount of times in the bathroom reduce drastically, 50 to 80% difference. Uh, we've also seen um, kind of autoimmunity, immune issues with like eczema, skin issues, uh, different inflammatory issues actually improve. So eczema slowly disappearing with our uh, some of the strains that we know are helpful for immune system issues. Uh, weight loss, we... So with weight loss, we not only use probiotics, we also infuse it with prebiotics in the supplement. So inulin is a huge supplement that we use that no, is known to um, kind of curb appetite as well as uh, improve certain bifidobacterium that are known to uh, cause weight loss. So we've actually seen reduction in, in, in weight as well. And so those are just a couple of use cases that we've seen that have huge benefit from uh, from our program. Do, um, I mean... I would guess for the uh, for it to take effect, the person would have to change how they eat as well. They can't just rely on swallowing pills you send them, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's why we think holistically about the program. Uh, if we were just trying to push out probiotics, uh, it, it just wouldn't be an honest approach. And so we have the the testing kit that provides the personalized nutrition. You know, we've gamified the report so that you know we're encouraging customers to you know daily do you know adhere to the diet and kind of see how they're progressing and improving their score. And, and kind of getting points throughout that process. And so we really think holistically about it. It's both the whole foods as well as the probiotics uh, to be able to, you know, confer a benefit. You know, we don't expect customers to just take a probiotic pill but drink beer every single day and somehow expect to feel better, right? <laughs> and so uh, to your point, yeah, both are absolutely necessary. Have you looked at, um, you know, diets out there like the uh, ketogenic diet or South Beach or low carb or low fat and have you seen what they do to people's microbiomes? Do you have any aggregate data on how those different diets affect people? Absolutely. Yeah, so we actually just published a uh, uh, an article with uh, Well and Good, which is a women's health blog on juice cleansing and the microbiome. So we had a uh, sample size um, that um, did a juice cleanse, and we were able to see how the microbiome shifted in that. Um, we also did a McDonald's diet, funny enough, <laughs> uh, uh, where we saw a change in the microbiome there. Yeah, not pretty. Um, and then uh, we also did a ketogenic diet as well. And so we, we've done a lot of different kind of uh, popular diets and seeing how that affects the microbiome. We also have that in our personalized reports, so customers can actually filter the foods that we recommend based on their allergens, you know, what foods they're allergic to, as well as uh, what diet they adhere to. And then that curated list will kind of dynamically shift based on their preferences. And that's how we gather our research and our data on that. Well, so you said the McDonald's diet people didn't seem to do well, which makes sense. What about the ketogenic diet or some other ones? Any interesting data points you saw, ones that you first saw? So what I can comment on, uh, for the ketogenic diet, we're actually still analyzing. Uh, we have the data right now, but we haven't created the report. I can comment on two, uh, two different diets, which is the juice cleanse and the Soylent diet, which we did as well. So the juice cleanse, we saw an increase in a specific bacteria that helps you digest seaweed. And we also saw an increase of bacteria that's known to be anti-inflammatory. So causing weight loss as well as uh, anti-inflammation uh, based on the juice cleanse. Um, and then for the Soylent diet, we actually saw a decrease of a specific uh, probiotic that's known to protect against diseases like uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. So on the Soylent diet, that, that good bacteria actually decreased. So you're, 
you know, the correlation is that on a soylent diet, you actually are more susceptible to uh, potentially inflammatory bowel disease. What is a soylent diet? What does that mean? Oh, soylent, uh, if your audience is not familiar, soylent is a kind of a meal replacement drink. Um, you may have seen it where it's made out of soy and all these different types of minerals and ingredients. Uh, a lot of people in Silicon Valley tend to just eat that as their meals because they're quote unquote busy. And so soylent is kind of, some people actually just drink this shake for months on end. Uh, as their food source. And so we were, we tried this diet um, and we looked at data on this diet specifically to see how that affects the microbiome. And suffice to say, probably not the best diet to adhere to on the long term. Yeah, I thought you meant Soylent Green, like that movie where they ate people from the 1970s. I was laughing. That's actually, yeah, funny, funny you mentioned that. Uh, Soylent's uh, name actually came from that movie. So if you can think, uh, if you've seen that scene in The Matrix, you know, when Neo gets out of the, the pod and he's eating food for the first time in the real world and it's just a sludge, that, that's kind of like Soylent. What, what do people think? It's like a perfect all-in-one food. Is that why they have that for months on end? Yeah, I mean, the goal, I mean, I don't want to speak for Soylent's brand because, you know, that's that's not our company. But the idea is that, hey, if you if you miss lunch, you can still drink the shake and get all the new, you know, percentage of the nutrients you need on, on a daily basis through that drink. Okay, makes sense. Gotcha. Um, what about uh, bacteria surviving the stomach? I've heard that, um, you know, depending on stuff, how stuff's packaged and all that, it's, you know, the stomach's a very harsh environment. How do you make sure stuff survives and gets to the large intestine and maybe small intestine? I'm not sure where it's supposed to go. But. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, to your point, uh, the large intestine or the colon is where the probiotics are supposed to be to confer benefit. And so when you think about the human digestive system, you have, you know, food goes in your mouth, it hits the esophagus, then it hits the stomach acids and the stomach. Then the stomach goes down to the small intestine, and that gets digested even more, and then they hit your colon. And so that's a very long process with a lot of different harsh environments. And the way we do it differently is we actually coat our um, our capsules, and they're made out of cellulose, which is an indigestible fiber for the for the stomach acids as well as the small intestines, but actually gets digested by the bacteria in your colon. And so that's how we actually protect the probiotics to make it all the way through the digestive system into the colon to be uh, beneficial. Also, our strains are, um, you know, researched and created in a way that they're able to bypass stomach acids. So, you know, the bile acids from uh, from your stomach as well as the secondary bile acids. And so we thought about both the probiotic strains themselves, finding the right strains, as well as the capsule to be able to bypass and make it through colon unscathed. Hmm. What about a suppository? Do you think that just people would want that and would that be effective? You know, we've heard a lot of customers try to do enemas or suppositories uh, to infuse probiotics. Uh, we encourage you to take it the other route. <laughs> it's a little bit uh, non-invasive, but I can understand why people want to do it the other way. If they just want to make, you know, get all the bacteria there as, as smoothly as possible. Uh, but we would encourage people to uh, take it through the oral route. Have you thought about developing, developing a suppository or is it not needed? Or you think that people... Uh, I think... Up? I think the general public probably needs to get uh, more comfortable with that. Um, I think in terms of the science and um, getting the probiotics there, I mean, I, I can understand. Uh, it definitely provides a little bit more um, uh, protection for the probiotics, but we think we're going to probably stay in the capsule form uh, through the oral route uh, for more of the short and long term. Okay. I've seen a few that are powders. Have you guys thought about the powder route, or is that too messy and too much of a hassle? Yeah, there's you know two things we consider when we think about you know, the, the product is the convenience of taking it and as well as the survivability of the probiotics. So uh, when we think about powder, it's less convenient than a capsule because you have to open it, put in some water and smoothing and to make all that. You can't really make it on the go. And the other side of it is just the survivability. When you're taking the powder, it, it goes through all the stomach acids and it hits the colon, not completely uh, there. And so uh, we figure that's probably not the best route. Okay. Um so this, uh, the custom probiotics you send, is it a 30-day supply, 90-day supply? Do you, you know, do you take it every day, multiple times a day? What's the recommendation? Yeah, so it's uh, one to two pills a day, depending on how we personalize it for you. So we don't give everyone the same amount of CFUs. You know, we realize with the data, some people that are healthy require less CFUs. Uh, some people who are, have more serious health issues require more CFUs. And so... Uh, everyone's kind of different in how many pills they take, but it's usually, you know, one to two pills. Uh, we send a monthly supply, 
Uh, and so you get a fresh one every month shipped on ice. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, do you, so people are encouraged to keep it in the fridge, and then just they just have one or two pills a day according to what you tell them to take. And exactly. And yeah, and I, I will say that our probiotics are room stable for up to four weeks at room temp, and so technically you can still take those probiotics with you when you travel and just put them in the fridge when you get to the hotel or whatnot. And so we're not completely confined to the refrigeration process, but we want to ensure as much as possible that we get it to you completely perfect and pristine. Uh, that's why we ship it on ice and refrigerate it through the shipping process. And um, just to go back to it, so you talked about Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, et cetera. What about um, weight loss? Do you have a lot of people that think this could be a, you know, an, an aid for them to lose weight? And what are your comments on weight loss? Do you think this could have an effect or what are you able to say? Absolutely. So the strains that we've uh, curated for weight loss issues uh, have very strong clinical evidence from our partners. So we use our uh, research partners and our manufacturing partners and their data for weight loss uh, related type of um, health goals. We also incorporate inulin, which has shown with a lot of research to improve certain bacteria that helps with weight loss. And so uh, just, that's just the probiotic in itself, but we really believe that is in conjunction with your diet. You cannot just take a pill or a probiotic pill and just assume that you're going to just lose weight. And we think it's both that and dietary uh, kind of uh, recommendations and so the foods we um, recommend um, based on your health goal are specifically tied to if your if your goal is weight loss and those foods are specifically tied to weight loss and increasing the bacteria known to help with weight loss. Okay, makes sense. Um, yeah. Have you had any uh, anyone that you know has told you, oh wow, you know I lost a bunch of weight because of this, or is that still like a new type thing? Or it it's relatively new, but we've actually had customers uh, tell us. Uh, and so we're very, very excited about the results uh, that we've seen, at least the initial results, uh, customers losing a couple pounds uh, just being on the program itself. So. Okay. Um, I guess last couple of questions. Uh, where do you see this going? You know, what's on your roadmap to develop over the next six months, year, two years? Just getting better at this? Uh, are there any breakthroughs that you sense that are coming? Yeah. So kind of the short term is, you know, we're going to continue tracking away at the personalized probiotic. Uh, continue to improve our reports. We're planning to uh, release uh, different testing kits on different areas of the body, so from skin microbiome to the oral microbiome, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we plan to release um, other sequencing, not just bacteria. So we're going to look at fungi and uh, yeast. We plan to look at uh, viruses as well, so we get the whole picture of the microbiome. And we plan to release uh, more testing kits for, you know, different uh, age groups, so children, adults, even for pets, and so to be able to test your, mm. your, your pet's microbiome, what foods they should eat, and so on and so forth. And then the probiotics, you know, just offering more strains for different conditions uh, to really continue to hone in on the personalization. And so that's kind of the short term in the next six months to a year. In terms of the long-term vision of our business, we're looking at, um, you know, everybody's microbiome is completely unique. And so every product that we interact with, whether it's the shampoos we use, the toothpaste, the foods we eat, the supplements we take, the medications, and so on and so forth, are all going to interact with our body differently because our microbes are all different. And so right now, every single one of those products are using an outdated nutrition fact, right? So one calorie in for you is going to be completely different for me. How that one specific ingredient in that Coke is going to be completely different for me than it is for you. And so we really see Thrive as the data platform that aggregates microbiomes across the world from every single, you know, man, child, and pet across body sites and all across different products so that in the future, you're going to look at every single product that you find off the shelf, you know, at your Whole Foods and, and so on, or anything you buy online on Amazon are going to be completely personalized for you. So I know exactly which that's toothpaste great. works best for me and which food works best for me. And so that's really where we see the business going. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, I should have asked you at the beginning, you said the whole reason you got into this is you took antibiotics and then you got really sick. So um, what do you suggest for people that, you know, they get sick? Um, should they take the probiotics along with antibiotics if they have to take them? Should they take it before or after? You know, what's any recommendations there that you're allowed to make? Yeah, so obviously not a physician, but um, if your doctor or medical professional tells you to take your antibiotics, you know, do what your um, medical practitioner uh, recommends. Uh, but in terms of the probiotics, we do encourage you to take probiotics during the antibiotic treatment. And so if you're taking antibiotics in the morning, as a pill, take your probiotics at night so that you're not, if you take them in conjunction, you're going to be killing the probiotics that are entering your system. And so take that while you're on that. But really the biggest benefit is actually 
the weeks after your antibiotic treatment. And so let me give you an example. Uh, Clostridium difficile is a very serious gut infection that's kind of plaguing uh, the U.S. right now, and it's caused by antibiotics. So what ends up happening is you take antibiotics, wipes out all the good bacteria, wipes out all the bad bacteria, doesn't discriminate. And the bad bacteria, which is this Clostridium difficile, starts overgrowing your gut. Now, your, bo your body and your gut is actually going at war. So the good bacteria are trying to take over the gut. The bad bacteria are trying to take over the gut, and they're both kind of fighting to see who can take the most land, if they will, if you will. And mm -hmm. so there's, after the antibiotic treatment, your gut is completely barren, and this, there's this war going on, and you want to help the good bacteria by introducing other good bacteria to start taking over the land quicker, if you will. And so the probiotics, when you take it afterwards, is helping your body fight back the bad bacteria that's trying to be opportunistic and trying to take over. And so we encourage you to take it after as well. Uh, for two, three weeks, and so on and so forth, until you start feeling yourself getting better. All right. So, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so this could help blunt the impact, the negative impact of taking antibiotics on people's exactly. microbiomes. You mentioned um, bad bacteria. So Clostridium difficile is one. If I said it right, what are some other mm -hmm. common ones that you see that people have, and what what it, does it do to them to have it? Do they feel fine, but uh, it's there, or do they feel certain symptoms? And it, you know, bacteria X tends to be there. You know, what do you see? Yeah. So the interesting thing about all these different pathogens is, you know, they're living in a host, so they're living in a human body, and each human body is a little bit different in terms of your genetics and your immune system and so on. And so there's actually some people that have C diff or Clostridium difficile in their body, but they don't actually have symptoms. And so kind of interesting to see, you know, we've, we've sequenced people that have very high counts of C. diff that don't have any symptoms and people that have a very low count of C. diff that actually have symptoms. And so uh, that's, you know, that's one kind of bacteria. The other ones are like E. coli, as you know, you probably read it from like Chipotle having an E. coli outbreak, uh, salmonella right. and so on. And so there's, you know, a lot of kind of these different microbes in different percentages. You know, usually when they're smaller percentages, they're probably not causing any issue. They're just part of your normal flora. But it's only until they kind of overgrow that you kind of have a problem. And so what we see, you know, depending on the microbe, the pathogens, if they're past a certain benchmark, then we start, you know, notifying customers and saying, hey, you know, we saw this, uh, talk to your doctor. Uh, we have certain food recommendations that you can eat to improve and to, like, like, lower those counts and, you know, look into that. But, you know, we always tell them to you know, always go to your medical professional. We're not a medical diagnostic company, so we can't diagnose people with certain diseases. We can only notify and say, hey, we saw this in your sample. You know, it's up to you to figure out uh, the rest of the next steps. Uh, but we do provide right. the food recommendations as a natural means. What do you see medical, how, how do you see medical doctors reacting? You know, do you have uh, customers that say, oh, I took the report to my doctor and he said, this is bullshit. Or do you see that they're welcoming of it? Or they're just like, well, all that's untested. It's voodoo. I mean, what, what reactions do you yeah. see? I think I definitely see two extremes. Um, so we have, you know, obviously the doctors who don't believe in this at all. Uh, they haven't really read the microbiome research, um, who, you know, just completely dismiss it. Uh, and then you have your kind of doctors who have read the medical research, who really believe in how the microbiome is going to be shaping our health. Um, and so those are really kind of the majority. And then you have kind of guys in the middle where they've seen the microbiome research, they know it's still early, they believe there's a lot of potential, but right now they just don't feel comfortable using it as a clinical diagnostic or a clinical recommendation and which, you know, that's kind of where we sit right now where we don't see the test as a clinical diagnostic. You know, we're not going to tell you that you have a certain disease and that you should go do something about that disease because uh, it's just, it's not quite there yet. We're not quite mature in the science as well as the product to be able to say those kind of things. And so we want to be as completely honest as we can with our customers, but we think there's a lot of potential. There's, a lot, there's still a lot of data that you can work off of to improve health and wellness, but uh, we would not recommend it as a clinical diagnostic test. Are you seeing, though, internally that it's predictive? You know, there are certain customers and you see their profile and you say, oh, no, it looks like this is going to happen to them because we've seen this many times before. Yeah, so I can't uh, comment on predicting illness, um, but we can definitely see that, um, you know, by improving and balancing the microbiome, you know, customers are generally more happy uh, about their health and how they feel. Um, but yeah, in terms of predicting a, an illness, uh, I think we're not quite there yet. Do you feel like it will happen? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely will. Yeah, it feels to me like this is going to be a huge missing piece to medicine. Uh, you know, it may yeah. not be the cure-all, but it'll definitely be a, me, a big help at some point. Absolutely. Let me give you just a quick example on that point about predicting uh, illness. Um, there's a really interesting study that came out about Parkinson's and uh, the gut microbiome. So there's a doctor called uh, Thomas Barodi in, in Australia. He's kind of a uh, the, the scientist or the doctor who 
really made fecal transplants kind of mainstream. And he had patients that had Parkinson's that came in for constipation-related um, issues. And he prescribed a triple antibiotic therapy, so three different antibiotics to wipe out certain bacteria in the Parkinson's patient's uh, kind of uh, microbiome. And he was able to reverse not only the constipation symptoms, but also the Parkinson's. Wow. And so he, he mentioned in his case study that some of these patients had constipation 10 years before they had Parkinson's, but he was able to predict based on the constipation symptoms and the microbiome associated with constipation to see how those how that eventually led to Parkinson's 10 years in advance. And so I think there's a lot of potential to be able to start seeing data eventually to the point where we'll be able to see which microbiome profiles are related to a certain kind of disease state. Uh, we don't do that right now with our product, but we do definitely see the right. science getting there. Well, very good. Sorry, sorry, I held you so long. I just, I'm very fascinated by this stuff, so I you know, appreciate you coming. Um, Absolutely. You know, let's give listeners resources. So where do they go to order their kit and to uh, to get started with you or to find out more? Absolutely. So if you'd uh, like to find us, we're at www.thriveinside.com. And, you know, for new customers, we love to get discounts just so you guys can understand the product at affordable price. Uh, if you'd like to use uh, Future Tech Podcast 15, which includes a 15% discount uh, on your first uh, order, uh, feel free to use that uh, coupon code as well. So it's Future Tech Podcast 15 uh, as a coupon code. That's great, Rich. I appreciate it. I'm going to be uh, ordering from you guys because I want to see, you know, I, I'm tired of seeing what's in there. I want to know what it's doing. So I definitely am going to be one of your customers. So that's, gr that's really great. I appreciate you coming. The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas. February 16, 17, and 18 in 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference. Go to BitcoinSuperConference.com and register today as a super early bird to get the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's BitcoinSuperConference.com. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.